Between this episode and the last one, we hit 10,000 downloads for Have the Nerve. Am I excited? Yeah, I am excited. You're listening to episode 30 of Have the Nerve, a podcast about disability. My name is Susan Wood and I am your host for this episode and all the other episodes. This podcast is about educating, informing, entertaining and advocating for people with disabilities. It's literally for everyone. So, as we go into this episode, let me ask you this question. For all the people out there who don't have a disability and don't need to use any continence products, don't know anything about it, how many times a year do you think the average person with a disability requiring products like these need to go to the bathroom? It's a lot. It's about 2,200 times. And how much does it cost? At a baseline, using a catheter is about the same amount as ordering a large oat milk cappuccino in Australia. In, in Sydney, I mean. And how do I know that? Because I think about that every time I order a large oat milk cappuccino in my Sydney suburb. It's a lot. So imagine being means tested for continence products that meet the basic need of you just being able to go to the toilet. And what does that mean for somebody who can't afford this? And how about what happens when you're an immigrant who needs to use continence products, but you don't qualify for any funding at all. Uh, My name is Edwina. I am one of the continence uh, clinical nurse consultants working with Coloplast, uh, and I currently cover New South Wales ACT. It's been a couple of years, but Edwina Spooner from Coloplast is back, and we talk about the very sobering realities for a lot of people who don't have access to a lot of funding or may not have access to funding at all, and the financial ripple effect that it creates. If you're new to the world of SCI and continence and you're all you're curious to learn, you can actually listen to Edwina on episodes three and four, where she goes into more in depth about the big wide world of SCI and the biggest thing that affects us all, continence management. So I, I can chat a little bit about the schemes that um, you can access both in, in Australia and New South Wales. So obviously I'm New South Wales based, so that tend to be where I focus. Um, So you've got the NDIS, but unfortunately you have to be injured before age 64 um, to actually be able to access that. So if you have an injury, you know, a week after your 65th birthday, you actually can't access that one at all. So your level of funding is significantly reduced. Um, Lifetime care is something that happens when you either have work cover or you have a, you know, a car accident. Um, So they generally don't have a huge issue with um, being able to access continence products. Um, They can usually get a pretty good budget. When you don't have either of those schemes or access to either of those schemes, there's a couple of things that you can access. There's something called CAPS, uh, which is basically a federal-based funding scheme. Um, You can access this if you're an Australian citizen, um, and it's a yearly cash payment of around $650. So um, $650 is not a huge amount if you look in the grand scheme of things of, you know, someone spending between, you know, $1 and $5 on a catheter, using five or six catheters a day it's a really big shortfall in what that they need um but also covers things like you know underpants and reusable pants and pants as well so um that's only a little tiny 650 dollar budget for that one um the other thing you can access in new south wales is something called enable funding um, and this is actually income dependent um so how this works is that you pay $100 $100 fee um, to New South Wales, enable New South Wales. And with that $100 fee, you get twelve dollars to $1,500 worth of products. So generally, if we're talking catheter-wise, um, and this is where I work with a lot of people, is trying to get the best catheters that they can actually afford in their budget um, and getting it through enable. But I'll, I'll touch a little bit on that later because um, that's a really big beast to, to conquer that one. Um, so the other one you can get is My Age Care Level 3 and 4 can actually get catheters funded. Um, generally, you can't get your, um, you know, really nice hydrophilic catheters that we all love funded, but you can generally get, um, you know, adequate catheters that what you need. Um, and then um, that, that's unfortunately about the, the maximum of um, schemes that we can actually get in New South Wales and Australia to actually buy continence products. So... Um, As you can see, there's a really, really big shortfall. Um, If you are a traveller from overseas um, or you're staying here and not an Australian citizen, you actually can't access anything. So I have seen instances where 
people have come over to stay with their children for a couple of years and whether it's to, to you know help with children or you know caregivers um, and they've actually then gone on to have an accident and because they actually aren't an Australian citizen they actually can't access anything so um, that is an incredibly sad and incredibly difficult that you know on, on top of your household budget which I can tell you everyone is stretched at the moment you've then got to buy something that that is basically to empty your bladder or, or look after your bowels so really basic needs that we need to take care of that a lot of people actually can't afford. I just did a quick calculation while you were talking. So if somebody gets the CAPS funding $650 and then they catheterise five times a day, you're good to go for 26 days. It's not not even a month. No. Can you get, can you get so, both? So if you look at like someone both that... enable... You can get both, yes, yeah. So you can get both. So you can get enable. Um, generally, I find pensioners get a little bit more of an allocation with enable, which is really good. Um, but it is really based on income. So, I mean, you know, looking at income things, though, I think they look at income. They don't always look at expenditure. So you may have a really, really good income, but if you've got a big house or you've got children at private school or you've got you know, um, parents that you look after or other things that you actually pay for, it doesn't take any of those expenses into account either. Um, and so even though you might have a really big income, you may not have a disposable income, So, um, which is really what you'd use to buy your catheters. Um, so looking at catheters, for someone that's using five or six catheters a day, um, you know, to empty their bladder, that's 2,200 approximately catheters a year that they're using. So even the, if you're buying catheters for a dollar, which is, you know, really about the cheapest catheter that you can buy, that is still a massive shortfall that, that you're actually not covering. So people actually have to then find in their budgets extra money to actually be able to do it. And, you know, this is really unfortunate because this is where we see people doing things like reusing catheters because they have no choice financially to actually not reuse a catheter because, if you don't empty your bladder, what happens is that the urine goes backwards. And so you end up doing permanent kidney damage. So it's a huge health issue that people actually don't have access to good continence products or single-use catheters to actually empty their bladder. So, you know, thinking about cost, long-term cost, it's much more expensive to have someone who has kidney failure than it is to give someone decent catheters so they avoid having kidney failure in the you know, in the future. So that's a really big one. Yeah, I, th I think people think very much about the short-term cost, not about the long-term cost. So so looking at the short-term cost, yeah, it's more expensive to give someone a clean catheter to use every time that they use, you know, empty their bladder. But it's actually much cheaper than maybe not having someone on dialysis or not having someone with kidney damage or not supporting someone long-term in hospital that, that actually can't live independently or you know, all those other things. So I think it's a little bit short-sighted in that regard, but I guess that's just how I feel. No, completely. And it didn't even occur to me until um, we started recording uh, people who are coming here from other countries who don't even have access to any schemes and just paying out of pocket. Um, and then you were talking about, you know, the cheapest possible catheter you can get is a dollar. And people are like probably thinking, great, a dollar, that's awesome. But what sort of catheter is a dollar? Mm. Yeah. So when you get a catheter for about a dollar, it's generally something that um, is obviously manufactured overseas because um, you wouldn't be able to manufacture much in Australia for that price. Um, but generally manufactured overseas, it's something that um, you have to add lubricant to. So thinking about, you know, your catheters, um, because you're passing your catheter into urethra, it has to be lubricated to actually pass all the way into the bladder. Um, when you've got a catheter that you've got to lubricate, what happens is often the lubricant doesn't always sit right on the catheter. Um, you're at higher risk of actually touching it because, you know, to get a good grip to pop it in. Um, and they actually they do their catheter, all the lubricant stays on the outside of the body. And when they're actually withdrawing that catheter, they're essentially withdrawing an unlubricated catheter because the lubricant's left on the outside of the body. So this is where... If someone back to, you know, doing catheters 2,200 times a year, um, this is, you know, something that, yeah, so someone doing, you know, 2,200 catheters a year 
um, the chance of things like, you know, withdrawal damage and, and urethral tearing and stuff is, is significantly increased. So if you've got, and there's, there's thankfully a lot of evidence um, out there now, which is great. If you've got someone that can use a catheter that has already got a lubricate on it, um, it's lubricated on the way in and on the way out. It's easier to use. It's a lot quicker for people. Um, you know, people much prefer these catheters as well because if you've got to go back to our bathrooms as well, if you've got to go back in and, and put everything down, trying to find and maintain cleanliness to actually open the catheter, put the lubricant in, you know, then try and empty it because it doesn't have a bag attached to it. So you'd have to transfer onto the toilet. So all of those risk factors that actually come in, um, you know, significantly in increase that um, the difficulty of people doing it. So using a catheter that's lubricated not only has all those little benefits of reducing urine infections and reducing that irritation and, and whatever of the urethra, it makes it a lot quicker for people as well. So they're super convenient. Could you just um, explain how people reuse their catheters? And, um, yeah, what do they do? Current research is really pointing away from the catheter reuse. Oh, we're definitely not condoning that. A bit like, you know, t 20 years ago it was okay my mum would, you know, put me in the bassinet on the floor of the car. You know, that, that was okay back then. It's not okay now because we know it's the safest thing to do is to put your child in a car seat. So, obviously, you know, it does... <laughs> does change over time so what we've actually found is is really best practice is single use catheters so um people that aren't doing um single use catheters what they're basically doing is they're using the catheter popping it in their body pulling it out and they're either cleaning it and soaking it in a solution to clean it um we also don't know a, a lot of the catheters and intermittent catheters are actually designed to be single use only because there's not enough research to say that the solution that you're cleaning it in is actually damaging the the fabric of the catheter or the you know the surface of the catheter so potentially you could be you know inserting plastics that are dangerous and, and that kind of stuff as well so that's why all of the manufacturers especially in Australia everything is actually designed for single use so reuse is really not recommended um some people put them in glycerin, wash them with soap and water. But as I said, you know what, if, if you don't have a choice, mm. some people actually don't have a choice. Mm. And so this is the only option that they have to actually empty their bladder. So which is really sad that they've this is their only choice. This is their only option. Um, therefore creating more urinary tract infections and more kidney damage. Yep. So increases the urine infection. So often what happens is, when someone has a urine infection, they end up, they've got to go to their GP. That's a cost. Um, you know, not a lot of GPs bulk bills these days. They've got to get a urine test done, which, um, you know, gets sent off. That's a cost. Even if it's bulk bill, that's a cost. Um, they often have to start antibiotics. So that brings down all the things like antibiotic resistance, um, you know, the cost of them actually then, you know, someone who's struggling to buy catheters then has to go and spend $20 on buying antibiotics um, to make themselves healthy enough. They then often either have to stay home from work or they can't look after children or grandchildren. You know, it stops them going out. They feel really unwell. Um, I guess in extreme cases when the urine infection gets bad, they end up in hospital. Um, that's also a big cost to the hospital as well because it costs, you know, it costs the government to have people in hospital unwell with urine infections. So, you know, it, it's frustrating that potentially this is something that's really, we could really reduce or really avoid um, actually people getting to this point just by spending a little bit more on better quality catheters or single-use catheters for people. As somebody who has been under those schemes, I, I say this all the time, the NDIS is both the best and worst thing that ever happened to me because I was under CAPS and Enable New South Wales and I I used to get repeated infections all the time because of the manner that I was catheterizing to the point where I felt like I was getting, like I was getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And, um, and then when I was finally able to afford the catheters through the NDIS, what a game changer. But for people who are in situations where they are not part of the NDIS and they're on a scheme that's means tested, it's very, very difficult. And, um, I feel I feel like continence nurses just do as much as they can to try and help 
their clients because they know what a health risk it becomes. Absolutely. I have to say, yeah, having a really good continence nurse is super important because, yeah, you, you work around all of these things. And as I said, there's lots of things that you can do, you know, really creative ways of actually being able to access more products for people. So often one of the biggest things I do is I, I look at someone's budget and say, okay, well, where can we work? So, you know, maybe through Enable we get some of the hydrophilic catheters, you know, the, the slippery catheters that they can use when they go out. And then, you know, with their CAPS money they can buy catheters are a little bit less expensive that they use at home that they can control the environment that they in you know that they, they can control the, their own environment that they're in so they can wipe down surfaces keep it really hygienic you know as much as possible it's their own toilet so transferring over to their own toilet so they're kind of their own germs that they're using at home so um, there's lots of different creative ways that we can do it um, one of the things I found um, especially with Enable is that um, to be able to get any kind of catheter that's not a basic catheter, you need to provide evidence. So thankfully, there's lots of really good evidence-based research out there that actually highlights how much better a hydrophilic catheter is um, compared to a normal uncoated catheter in regards to reducing UTIs, making it easier for people, having people having a better quality of life. Um, so all of those things. So um, when you submit your, your enable um, application and then put a little bit of evidence with it as well, you can generally get pretty good allocations. So as I said, it, it is based on your income as well. Um, but I, I do have people that can get up to 1,200 of the mid-range catheters that you add water to and it lubricates the surface. Um, some people can get up to about 1,200 of those a year. Generally, your hydrophilics, your allocation, your standard allocation is about 270 catheters. So that's not even one catheter a day. So that's not even one hydrophilic a day. So it's this huge shortfall in, in this area. So, so the hydrophilic catheter, sorry, that's the fancy term that we use for a catheter that's already coated um, with a lubricant on the surface. So what it is is that the lubricant is bonded to the surface of the catheter and what that means is they don't have to add an external lubricant. They just open the packaging, obviously wipe around the area, pop the catheter in and then remove the catheter and throw the catheter in the bin so that the um, lubricant's actually already on the surface of the catheter. They're not having to touch it. It's slippery on the way in and on the way out. So you're reducing all of those potential contaminants and um, urine infections. So, and, and much more comfortable for people as well. You know, it's easy to use a catheter that's ready to go than it is to have, you know, a catheter that you've got to add everything to. It just adds a couple more steps in there, which makes it, you know, a little bit more of a complicated process. So, yeah, I, um, if somebody is traveling from overseas or immigrates from overseas, um, or, you know, maybe there's a family member who's listening right now who has a family member who has a disability and they don't have access to care uh, and supports like these. What do you reckon their first port of call is? That's a really hard one. I think their first port of call is, is the local hospital. So often um, seeing someone at the local hospital that they would have to actually pay out of pocket for, though. Um, often, um, you know, people also have travel insurance, fingers crossed. Um, or, you know, some kind of insurance when they come over as well. Um, but generally, yeah, your, your local hospital would be your first port of call. Um, you could also try and access a nurse in the community. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of the time you've got to actually buy, purchase this stuff. So they've got to actually buy it, whether it's on, you know, from any of the medical companies or any of the, you know, really good medical distributors that we have in, in Australia. So they've got to actually purchase these things. Um, one thing I found... Um, on this topic as well, but also getting an increase in the allocation of enable catheters is that actually go and see your local member of parliament. So if you actually, your local member of parliament is designed to support you in your local community. So if you've got an issue or you want to get an increase in the allocation or you've got, as you said, you've got a relative from overseas that needs to buy these things, um, go and actually see your local member of parliament. What I recommend is emailing um, because then you've actually got a paper trail. So don't just pick up the phone and ring. A, they're really busy, and B, often the secretary isn't always aware of what's going on. So definitely emailing um, and, um, you know, just explaining your situation and, and maybe they can come up with a solution or put you in contact with someone that can actually help you because that's really what your local member of parliaments are designed to do is they're designed to support you 
um, in your local area. So that would be one of my first ports of call. It's so, it's so, it's so hard to navigate because you're working on the goodness of other people to come to the party for, for you to be able to go to the bathroom and I say it again. I mean, I haven't said it in this episode, but if you were in a situation where you had to be limited by the amount of times you were going to the bathroom, um, would you want that? No. Yet again, that, that comes on to the health costs as well, because we do have a lot of older people that I know that they, you know, I, I talk to them and they say, I'm only catheterizing three times a day because I just can't afford to do four and five. And so along with that comes all the other health issues that come into it. If you're not emptying your bladder enough, you know, you, you've got issues with kidney damage, you know, and, and as you get older on top of all the other issues you've got going on as well as, you know, your body gets a little bit older. So if you've got people not catheterizing because of a financial cost, that's that's heartbreaking, you know. There, there's something going wrong somewhere if people can't yeah. catheterize enough. So when people, are, like when people age and we've talked about, you know, not being able to access the right equipment anyway from a young age. What are some of the continents? Can... Oh, actually, you know what? Before I even ask you that question, <laughs> what do people do when they don't even have access to the right funding for bowel care? Yeah. So bowel care is another, um, another hard topic as well because often people um, do have issues with bowel care. Um so the funding actually comes into the same thing. So um, Enable will cover either generally one or the other or a mixture of both. So you wouldn't get huge funding for bowel care and huge funding for, for catheter care. So generally it's a bit of a one or the other. Um, and then it's a matter of using your CAPS funding um, to cover that shortfall, which really doesn't cover it. So bowel care, um, a lot of people actually self-fund. So... Yeah, which is really difficult. Yeah, and what what sort of price range are people, what sort of cost do people spend for their bowel care if they need it? It, it really depends. So if, if someone is using um, medications um, to actually get their bowels to work, you know, that really varies in cost from, you know, $5 to $50 a month. Um, if you've got someone that's doing, um, you know, enemas, so you've got to buy your enemas, your lubricant, your gloves, um, all of that that goes with it, you know, that can be 50 or or $100 a month as well. If you've got someone that's doing, um, you know, something like a bowel irrigation as well, um, that comes at another increased cost as well. And they can cost around, you know, the four to $5,000 a year mark. So um, there's really significant costs here that I think people don't actually take into account as well. So bowels are really important. And is this price range for people who are just doing it themselves or with assistance? Uh, both. Because both. with assistance... So be... that, that wouldn't even take into account manned hours. Yeah. So if you've got to then pay staff to come and help you, that's another cost again. Um, generally that comes out of your... If you're on your My Age Care, um, you can get onto your level three and four. Um, I think the really hard thing is, is that I get a lot of patients that struggle before 65 to actually get onto the NDIS. Mm. So I have a patient at the moment and she's got um, transverse myelitis, which is, is obviously an issue with the spine. And she has just been knocked back, knocked back, knocked back, knocked back because all she needs is catheters and a bit of physio. So they've basically said, oh, well, you can just do an ABLE. You know, you don't, don't need to get onto the NDIS. But the cost of the catheters and the only ones that she finds really comfortable to use, you know, cost nearly 10000 a year. So... How does she cover that for, shortfall? You know, she, she's working, her husband's working, they're paying a mortgage off, they've got children. How do you fit 10 grand into your budget? You know, it's it's really hard. And I know people will go without eating to actually buy the catheter that, that is easiest for them to use, which is really sad that people are actually having to choose between empty their bladder or eating, which unfortunately does happen. I feel like we've just recorded two episodes of what are we willing to sacrifice to go to the bathroom yeah. <laughs> or not as the case may be exactly yeah yeah but it's really sad that you even you know people actually do think about these things every day mm. Mm. you know and the cost of living is going up petrol's going up you know rent's going up you know mortgages are going up and so everything is going up and so there's almost smaller amounts now for people to be able to buy their catheters yeah. so what we're going to see is an increase in people who actually can't afford their catheters. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. What are some of the um, things that we need to take into account as we're getting older um, with continence issues? Um, that's pretty much amplified by an inability to be able to access the right supplies. Yeah. Well, I think as um, as people get to retirement age, you know, they have less disposable income. Um, often, um, when they when they do go and if they do get onto a pension, they sometimes get a little bit of a bump up in their an allocation that they get from enable. But there's still a really really big shortfall. So what we find is as people getting older, they're starting to reuse catheters. Um, you know, glass catheters are making a bit of a comeback as well, which is, is not ideal. They are. I've seen a couple of those because. People have no choice. They need to empty their bladder, but they need to be able to afford to do it. So, but do you do you just want to give a bit of a refresher as to what a glass catheter is Absolutely. and so, how is that making a comeback? Yeah. So glass catheters are exactly how they sound. So it's instead of being a you know hollow flexible tube, it's a hollow tube that's rigid um, and made of glass. So these were really commonly used for for quite a while, um, but have kind of gone out of. Um, fashion because you know people have realized that single use is obviously a lot more beneficial than reusing a catheter um, but when cost is starting to come into it people are finding um, they're going to, having to go back to doing this again so glass can you can sterilize quite well um, having said that a lot of people that I see using glass catheter, catheters are really not cleaning them properly um, and um, yeah, not using them appropriately so they're just at a much higher risk of developing things like a urine infection. So what is the type of cleaning method that is needed for a glass catheter? Um, it really depends mm -hmm. because we don't advocate reuse. Um, this is a really I mean, hard one to answer. Yeah. Some of the things that people have done in the past is washing with soap and water. Some people use boiling water. Some people use Milton or antibacterial solutions. <laughs> Milton, yeah. <laughs> so, yes. No, no, take me back to when my kids were babies. <laughs> mm. <laughs> that Milton smell. Yeah. Um, and some people um, uh, yeah, wipe them down and then put them in glycerin. So everyone's a little bit varied. And as I said, I really we really promote single use, um, but that's not always achievable unfortunately i think at a time when i was very limited to the catheters that i could have and it was the 90s it was it's very hard to uh, i went down the milton trail as well but one of the very early things they were trying to recommend my mum was literally just water in a dish that was um sanitized in a microwave for 20 minutes <laughs> and then and then like literally getting foil and then wrapping them up again because we couldn't yeah. access the well maybe the technology also wasn't there I, I don't know I was like six yeah. years old but like it's just so hard to even find affordable yeah. catheters absolutely and the schemes weren't a yeah. thing I, I always say to people if, if you're in a situation where you have to do that speak to your local continence nurse because I'm sure they've got lots of solutions but if not they can give you really good tips in reducing urine infections and trying to do it really cleanly and safely as well. So your local continence nurses will be one of your first ports of call, um, and they're generally a fantastic resource to have as well. Um, also in Australia, we've got the benefit of having the Continence Foundation of Australia, so that's basically a free national service. Um, you can go on a website and there's lots of videos. You can also contact them um, and be put in contact with a local continence nurse that can give you a little bit of advice um, around it as well. So really important to look at everyone's individual situation um, and kind of go from there. I think a lot of people I end up accessing in the community have never, ever received any kind of funding. So I come across people in their 80s who've been catheterising for 20 years that have just bought the catheters themselves. And so when you kind of have a chat to them and say, you know, you're actually eligible to get this funding and this funding, it's its almost like Christmas because they now have this option of being able to use a catheter that they like and fit it into their budget. So it's, it's quite a, um, I don't know, I, th I think it's just such a basic need for people. Yeah, it's a basic human right that is, is usually just not really uh, thought about. Um, but yeah. I was just thinking during this conversation somebody's listening to this conversation and they've never really spoken to anybody or they don't really know anybody who uses these types of products. They've never been in a situation where they've had to even think about it. 
Why should they even care that this is a this is a concern for people? One day you might be in that situation or one day your sister or your mother or your child might actually be in that situation where they require a catheter. Um, but I, I also think as a community it's really important that we're really inclusive and, and you know, this is what people require. It's just another thing. So I think it's really important for everybody to actually be aware of it um, and even though it doesn't affect you directly, does that mean that it's okay to completely ignore it? Um, I think, yeah, really important that people are, are on board and aware of it. So, But it, I do often see, um, you know, some of the social media posts that people put out and people are like, oh, why would you do that and why would you use a catheter? And I think, well, there's also obviously a huge education gap in there where people actually aren't aware that people have to use this stuff. And I think sometimes until people are in the situation where either they have to use a continence product or someone that they love has to use a continence product, that they're actually made aware of the fact that people actually have to use these products. So um, the more we talk about it and normalise it, the better. I, um, I just had a conversation with a child psychologist a couple of days ago. We were talking about masking disability as much as you can even though your disability is fairly obvious. And one of the first things that came up was um, uh, catheterization and bathroom because, like, you're not having those conversations with your friends about how often you need to go to the toilet, so you just don't go to the toilet. Um, and so I guess um, coming back around, you know, when you're not really discussing these and you and I, I will attest to the fact that in high school I didn't tell anyone what I was doing. Mm. Uh, now I don't really care. Um, I need to go to the bathroom right now. Um, but um, you know, when people don't know and they're not open to those conversations, to the education element that you were saying earlier, we don't really know that yeah. these are deep concerns mm. and deep concerns for people who are just not just children, yep. adults into early. Um, into their older age um right up to the point of death like the bathroom is so important at every single stage of their life absolutely yeah absolutely and it can be really really hard i mean i think as a kid it's so hard to fit in anyway um and then having to have that other layer of oh you have to use a catheter you know um which is why you know it's really good that there's some really discreet ones available um, you know, and it's really important that, you know, kids especially have access to really good catheters because if you're using a really good catheter from a younger age, not only is it easier and it's easier to have people that are going to be compliant with doing it enough, um, which is going to be better for your long-term health. So if you've got something that's easier and, let, you know, more discreet for kids to use, they're more likely going to catheterise. So instead of going, you know, hours and hours and hours without catheterising because, you know, they're a bit embarrassed or they don't want to talk about it, you know, giving them a product, if they're not quite ready to talk about it, giving them a product that's really discreet that they can kind of use independently and, and pretty privately um, will make a huge difference to their life. So, you know, we, we should be funding these things. Especially especially if, if the child is, it's already a traumatic experience having to do it yourself and then to be able, and then doing it to yourself and then it's not the equipment that you needed well, it's not the equipment that's the best for you. Um, and then it comes along with a lot of different um, uh, health concerns. Um, and then if you're not using the equipment properly anyway, it also comes with further health concerns. Absolutely. And also I think, you know, cleanliness of kids as well. I mean, you know, one of, um, one of my favourite catheters for, for boys especially is one of our catheters that has a sleeve. Um, and it's a really, really good one because... You know, I know even just with my nine-year-old, as much as I ask her to wash her hands, I can tell you she never washes her hands. Like, she's she's a grot. So she'll go to the toilet and every time she comes, I'm like, do you wash your hands? Yes. Let me smell your hands. Okay. Back she, she goes back into the bathroom. So trying to get kids as well to do things like washing their hands is really hard. So especially I find the teenage boys having a catheter that's got a sleeve on it it's not the end of the world if they don't wash their hands. They're not contaminating the catheter because they can touch the catheter. It's got the sleeve on it so they actually don't contaminate it. So little things like that that I think people don't realise until you're in that situation, 
that can make life so much easier for for you know certainly a teenage boy to go and use the toilet yeah and is there an equivalent uh no not equivalent but is there a better way for a a female uh child who's also catheterizing because the um, u- female urethra is only four centimetres, um, they've got the little discreet um, ones that you can get that look like a little lipstick. So I guess the idea is that, you know, if you go out in your bag and everything drops everywhere, people aren't actually going to know what it is. It's not like, you know, you drop a tampon out of your bag and everyone goes, oh, my gosh, she's got a tampon. So it- it's kind of not the same thing. They're really, really discreet and they're designed to look like a lippy. So... Um, I think those are probably the equivalent for, for girls to use because they're really discreet. And there's also the catheters that you can get with the bags on them as well, so the drainage bags. And how, so, how much are they? Um, that they can use. And how much are they? Yeah, they're $3 a catheter. Yeah. So they're, sorry, how much? Any, any catheter on the market that has a drainage bag ranges between 9 and $12. Wow. So they're really awesome. If you're on the NDIS or lifetime care, great, you can have a bagged catheter when you go out. If you're on Caps and Enable, it's a pipe dream. Hmm. So so for you to go out and go and have a coffee and use, you know, hopefully an accessible toilet when you go out using a bagged catheter, that's an extra $10 on your day. So I think people don't take these little things into account. Do you ever find that there are people who, uh, because of the lack of being able to afford continence products, they just don't go out? I'm just think about how, especially if they were to go out, I don't know, go out and socialize with their friends or something. I think we've discussed this in the past. Alcohol triggers off something in the bladder and you need to go like constantly, which you would probably not want to do uh, if you could not even afford the catheters to be able to go to the bathroom in the first place. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think, um, you know, it also comes down to, you know, people have the right to be social as well. You know, it's nice to go out and it's good for your mental health to go out and be with your friends and socialise and, and be part of the community. So that's really beneficial for you. So I think um, like I had a, a client once and he, just to go out, you know, he used to have this big backpack. He'd have a big bottle of lubricant. He'd have a couple of catheters. You know, he'd have um, a bottle to drain it into because he couldn't safely transfer to a toilet. Um, and so he kind of had all of this bulky stuff he had to go out with. So often he said people look at you when you go into the bathroom because you have this big bag with you. Mm. Whereas um, what I did with him is that um, he managed to get onto the NDIS and so we got him a catheter that was really tiny and discreet and it was hydrophilic, so it was one of the slippery catheters. And that's all he had to take with him. He just had to take a packet of wipes and the catheter and that was it. So what a difference! Him, it made it so much easier and so much less stressful for him to actually leave the house, which is what it's about you know we want people to be in the community and we want people to socialize and and go out so and i think it comes back around to how much are you willing to spend on the people now to prevent them from spending down the line on on additional hospital costs and that sort of thing i think there needs to be a huge um emphasis on on prevention prevention is better than cure so if we can actually prevent people having lifelong health problems um, you know, just by spending a little bit more in the short term and, and giving them access to better products and, and, you know, better things to be able to, you know, benefit their health, then why aren't we doing it? You know, to me, it's a bit of a no-brainer. Yeah. All right, Edwina, thank you very much. Do you have anything you want to add before we... No, thank you so much for having me. I, I really love having these conversations because it's really important that um, we start to chat about these things, normalise these conversations, Um and really start to look at what we can do to help people get better access to better quality products. Yeah. Amen. You've been listening to Have the Nerve. This podcast has been written, produced and edited by me, Susan Wood. If you would like to know more about anything we've discussed in this episode, please check the show notes in this podcast. Thank you for listening.